Good morning, church. So good to be here this morning to worship our God together. Just invite you to come in. We've got seats at the front here, seats at the front there. Come in and, and stand up. And we're going to start with just worshiping our God and declaring how good He is. this morning it says enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues through all generations and that's us this morning coming into church coming into his presence and his spirit's presence this morning just as we just want to give you the freedom just to worship our God this morning to let go and give things to him just praise Him this morning. Everyone left in the grave All the wars 
good. Please just take a seat for a moment because I'm going to share a little bit of a story this morning. And I often share stories about when my kids say things that are really profound and really beautiful and loving. And this morning is actually not one of those mornings, okay? I'm going to share something my, one of my children said that, um, that is not, it's out of character for them, okay? So I just want to give a bit of acknowledgement there. This is not how they normally speak. They were tired and cranky at the time. But I just want to share with you uh, something they said and just give a bit of context to that as well too. And I hope that some of the parents here with a bit more experience than me maybe have gone through this before or maybe have heard those kind of words similar. But let me just set the picture. So one of my children asked me for a glass of water and I said, yeah, I can, I can get you a glass of water, but you are, you know, you're perfectly capable of going and getting your own glass of water as well. And they, and they, they were tired already at the time and looked at me and they said, Dad, you don't do anything for me. Do you even love me? And it's like, oh, dagger to the heart right there. And they, uh, you just, you know, it's coming from a place where they're not normally at, but you just want to respond and say, look, I do, I've done everything for you. I've given so much energy and time to you. But in that moment, they're just focusing on, on what's ahead and what they want right now. And they lose sight of that gratitude of all you've done before them. And sometimes, look, in a, in a different context, sometimes I can be a little bit the same to God sometimes. Sometimes I can lose a bit of track of everything that He's done before when I just want something. And, and when, when God's called me into something, I'm like, God, just do that. Make it happen. But we need to acknowledge that all that's gone before us and, and the love and the gratitude for what He has done. And look, it's in the Bible. God's people lose track of that too. God's people, you see it in Exodus when they... They're slaves in Egypt, and God brings them out with these miracles, wonders. God brings them out of Egypt's slavery, and they get to the desert, and they go, God, do you even love us? We're, we're, we're out in the desert now. We're just going to die in the desert. Did you even love us? All that stuff didn't even mean anything. And then he gives them, he gives them, and then he, after that, he gives them manna, he gives them water, so they're nourished. They've got food and water, and that's good for a little while. And after a while, they say, oh, God, this, this manna just doesn't, doesn't taste good. It doesn't fit doesn't fit what I want. I like it crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. It's not quite right. Okay, I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but it doesn't taste as good as I want it to. And they, and they lose track of everything that God did before them. I just want to encourage you this morning as we come to Him, we just want to come with open hearts and with gratitude for all that He has done. There's so many good things in store in the future, but sometimes the beautiful thing about, about prayer and about reading His Word, about coming here to our church and worshipping in song is just that we can come to Him and realign ourselves with His values, realign ourselves with really what God wants for us. So just invite you to continue to do that this morning as we sing this next song, which is called Gratitude.
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord Come on my soul Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul Cause you've got a lion inside Darkness running out of an empty 
Psalm 146 says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my soul. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. He sets prisoners free and gives sight to the blind. He lifts up those who bow down. The Lord loves the righteous. He watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and widows. The Lord reigns forever. Amen. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God who reigns above it all. You reign over this universe, Lord, and all that's in it. And you reign in our hearts today. And we say thank you this morning. Amen. Welcome to church this morning. Why don't you turn around and say hello to someone that you might not have said hello to before. Good morning and welcome to Brackenridge Baptist this morning. If you're watching online, we want to say welcome to you as well. My name is Lee. I am no longer the new care pastor here, but I'm just the care pastor here. Um, We want to welcome you this morning. If you are new or you're visiting, a special welcome to you. If you'd like to know more information about the church or connect with our weekly e-newsletter, there's a connect card up the back or you can do that online to fill in your details and we can get some more information to you. That'll be lovely. There's also um, tea and coffee after the service. If you'd love some tea and coffee, um, you are more than welcome to. But please stay around after the service. We'd love to um, stay and have a chat with you. Kids, uh, there is kids church on today and youth church. So if you have kids and they'd love to come to kids church or youth church, you can sign them in around um, in the annex next door and a reminder for parents to sign them out as well um, at the end. Uh, The parents room up the back this morning, unfortunately, um, as the rain has affected that room but if parents you're needing a change room this morning there is a change room in the toilets um, this disabled toilet otherwise um, parents feel free to use the cafe as well if you need a little bit of a space for a bit of a time out with the kids if you need it during the service that'll be no worries at all We were supposed to have our men's um, event on last night, but that has been postponed. So, men, if you were planning to go, um, there will be an email coming out this week about a new date for that. Men, if you weren't able to go and you wanted to go, this is your second chance. So, when that date comes out, um, we'll be able to let you know and um, you can register for that. Women, we have our Women's Embrace event happening next Saturday night. Um, Hopefully, that won't be postponed. I'm 100% sure it won't be postponed. Maybe 99% sure I won't be postponed. Let's never be 100%. But it'll be a great night. So ladies, if you have not registered yet, um, I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, We've got some really exciting things coming up for March. Uh, So if you'd like to look at the screens now, it'll let you know all these great things that you can be involved in.
Ladies, we have an exciting event coming up for you this term on Saturday the 2nd of March. We will be holding our Embrace Women's Gathering from 4pm till 8pm. This will be a time to gather for worship and prayer and to hear some amazing stories and Bible teaching from some of the women in our church. As always, there will be some delicious food served. What more could you want? Worshipping a great God with great food and great company. So ladies, if you are young or you are young at heart, we look forward to seeing you on the 2nd of March for a great night together. Registration details and more information is available on the church website. If you've joined our church recently, we would love to invite you to our Newcomers Morning Tea on Sunday the 3rd of March following the morning service. If you've been coming to church for a while and you've never been to a morning tea, you are more than welcome to come along too. This is a great opportunity to meet the pastoral team, to hear a bit more about the church and also to meet others who have recently started attending Brackenridge Baptist Church. A lovely morning tea and refreshments will be provided for you. So for catering purposes, it would be helpful if you could register ahead of time through the church website. However, if you are new and you haven't had the chance to register, you're still welcome to come on the day. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, getting baptised is an important next step in your journey. Baptism is a public declaration and demonstration of the faith that you already have in Jesus. It's an expression that the old has gone and that the new is here. But what's significant about baptism? Why be dunked under water? And why did Jesus himself want to be baptised when he was sinless? If you've got questions like this, we'd love to support you in this next step of faith by exploring the meaning and calling of baptism at our baptism information session on Sunday the 3rd of March at 4pm. Register for the session online by heading over to the website on the events page. Youth Camp is fast approaching. We have an awesome weekend planned, packed full of activities, surfing, fun, beach and hanging out with friends. But we are so excited to go away as a youth community and encounter God together and learn more about Him. Camp's happening in March. Registrations are now open, so make sure you head to the website or grab a flyer for more details. We have a couple of things that we would love for you to know about our Bracco Kids Ministry on Sunday mornings. The first thing is we are asking all kids to bring their Bibles to church every Sunday. This is going to align so beautifully with our church vision this year. So kids, bring your Bible along so we can open them together and read God's Word. The second thing I'd love to share with you, as a church, we want you to have conversations with our kids. So we're having the Memory Verse Challenge. Our kids out in their um, programs every week are learning God's Word. So what we want you to do is if you know a child after the service or you see a child standing with their family, we're encouraging you to go up to them and say, hey, what's the Memory Verse that you're learning in Kids Church at the moment? If they don't know it, that's okay. Ask them about what they're learning. We want to gather together as we disciple our kids because we believe that the church plus the home is a greater impact. So let's do this together as we encourage and disciple our children. We had such a lovely time at our Christmas senior service last year with over 100 people attending. So I'm excited to say that senior services are back for 2024. We have our first service coming up on Wednesday the 13th of March, 2pm till 4pm in the Church Auditorium. With Easter not too far away, we'll have a special focus on the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. As usual, we'll have some people sharing worship songs that are close to their hearts, followed by a message and a delicious afternoon tea. Financial donations are welcome to cover the cost of the afternoon. So if you have Wednesday afternoon free, come along to our senior service on the 13th and enjoy the afternoon. On Sunday, the 17th of March, in our 9am service, we are having our brigades join us. 
Boys Brigade and Girls Brigade are a valued ministry of our church here. So we're inviting them along to come and share what they're going to be doing for the year and also to celebrate this great ministry together. Everyone is welcome to come along to that service. And after the service, we are all heading down to Decker Park to have a church picnic. So we really love you to come along, bring your own lunch with you down to Decker Park, bring some chairs and some games. It's a beautiful time as a whole church family to get together in the park and enjoy some food. Brackenridge Baptist Church has a long association with the wonderful work of the Eagles Wing School in Zambia. And we are very excited to be sending a medical team to Zambia in July to assist with the needs of the community there. Please join us for a night of African food and music to raise funds to support our team. We will be taking part in an interactive drumming experience, which will be loads of fun, a little bit like what you're watching on the screen right now. Come along on Saturday, the 23rd of March, 6 to 9 p.m. at Brackenridge Baptist Church. Tickets are $40 for adults and $100 for a family. This includes the dinner and the interactive entertainment. Please register through the church website. Come and join us in the fun. Good morning everyone and welcome to church this morning. Great to have uh, all of you here. If you haven't met me before, my name's Dave and I'm the, uh, the lead pastor here at the church. And in just a minute, we're going to be uh, beginning our new series uh, together that we'll be going through over four weeks. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to uh, just uh, speak to uh, towards the giving in the life of the church. As we say every single Sunday, uh, thank you so much to all of you who do give to the life of the church. But I just really wanted to uh, to point to this once again um, as, a, uh, as a church family. Um, at the moment, for those of you who do call our church home, we are sitting at uh, 89% um, of our budget, which, uh, which uh, it might not sound like a, like a huge uh, shortfall, but unfortunately uh, that does leave quite a shortfall for us uh, when we're thinking about um, things that we're able to do in regards to uh, this financial year. Um, one of the difficulties that we've found over this financial year is, of course, the rise in all costs. Electricity has gone up, the cost of everything has gone up significantly over this, uh, over this current financial year. And so I just really want to encourage those of you who do call our church home. Once again, as I say, this is for those of you who do call our church home. Could I just ask you to, uh, to please pray about your giving, to consider your giving into the life of uh, this church, um, because we do really want to uh, keep being able to do everything that we believe that God has, uh, has called us to. Um, hey, before we get into our, uh, our uh, series and sermon for this morning, uh, let me just pray and then we'll uh, get into things. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for, um, for this morning. Thank you for the amazing times of worship that we've already been able to spend together. And Lord, as we come before your word right now, we just ask that you will speak to us through it. We thank you for this amazing gift that you have given to us. And we ask that you will, right now, by your, by your spirit, um, I guess, transform our hearts, transform our minds as well, um, so that we are more aligned with you, our King Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This morning, we're beginning a brand new series called, uh, called The Gospel. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, this is a word that would be somewhat familiar for you and is usually connected with Christian faith and the church in some form or way. Uh, in 1874, the first use of the phrase gospel music was used to describe a particular type of song with a particular type of lyrical content, um, but also came to speak to a very specific style. In the 1920s, gospel music became more widespread through the popularization uh, of the radio, but over the past century, gospel music continued to grow in popularity with various offshoots, including these, black and southern gospel music, uh, soul gospel music, bluegrass gospel music, and Celtic gospel music. For some reason, gospel music doesn't just refer to its lyrical content, but also to, uh, to a certain style. Um, the word gospel, it's often used in association with, uh, with the Christian faith and the church, but in particular, it's one of those words that can be used to such an extent within 
Christianity that we don't really think about uh, what we're saying when we are saying it. Over the past 15-ish years, there's been uh, a growing push from certain groups within the Christian faith to ensure that we are gospel-centered and that our theology of everything is founded on the gospel. There's been a lot of talk of the gospel over the past 15-ish years. Now, for those of you who uh, have been a part of the church for a very long time, you might be thinking, really? A series on the gospel? That's pretty basic, isn't it? Why are we doing a series on that? A few years ago, I was, invo- I was uh, talking to someone who was invited to give a seminar to some pastors on this exact topic, on what is the gospel. This person was invited to help some pastors be able to give a clear presentation of the gospel to different audiences that they came into contact with. Now, you would think that out of everyone, a group of pastors would be the ones who should be able to communicate and contextualize the gospel effectively to different groups that they come into contact with. They went around the room, this person, asking the pastors to express how they would summarize the gospel in a fair, uh, to a fairly neutral audience to start out. And one pastor in particular said this as his uh, simple summary of the gospel, which was that God loves you. Now, by any standard of a gospel presentation, if you were just simply saying a gospel summary is just God loves you, that is a severely lacking gospel presentation. Which God? I mean, many Muslims would be able to say that about the God that they worship. It just struck my friend in this moment as he was doing this presentation to these pastors that this pastor wasn't able to clearly communicate what he believed the good news of Jesus to be. Now, it's fairly clear that whilst we and Christians around the world use this word gospel fairly frequently, many Christians are unable to really think through clearly about what the gospel actually is or what we mean when we use this word gospel. This makes living out the Great Commission uh, very difficult. If we have been told by Jesus to go and share the good news with the whole world, we need to know what this good news actually is. Before we go any further, (coughs) I just want to reassure those of you who might have been attending church for a long time and honestly aren't really able to do this for yourself, that that's okay. As I said previously, the idea of being gospel-centered has been pushed more and more over the past 15 years, and while it's important that we understand the gospel, I have seen this forceful push of the gospel be damaging to some people uh, within their own faith. A few years ago, I listened to a sermon in church, and we had a guest speaker come along. I wasn't at this church. Uh, This preacher was very forceful in his view of the gospel and very narrow in his understanding of how it could possibly be presented. During his sermon, he effectively said, if you are unable to summarize the gospel clearly for me, right now, then you need to question whether or not that you are a Christian. That preacher unintentionally, essentially, preached a works-based salvation based on being able to have a clear gospel presentation, something that goes against the gospel. Following the service, there was a uh, a dear older lady uh, of the church who I had known for a very long time, and she said to me, I actually don't know if I am able to do what this preacher had said during their sermon. Does that mean that I am not a Christian? This older lady had a beautiful, gentle, kind, and very simple faith in Jesus, and she loved Jesus really dearly. Because she wasn't able to articulate something clearly, obviously that doesn't affect her relationship with Jesus. And I reassured this lady um, that she was okay in her faith with Jesus, but I did say to her that it is worthwhile doing what she can to be able to know what aspects of the gospel are important, because if she wants to tell people about Jesus, she needs to know what's important for her to share. Now, based on both of these different examples, it became clear to me that the gospel is something that needs to be taught and reinforced again and again, even for those of us who have been disciples of Jesus for a long time. And yet we do this with understanding, kindness, and a theology that is based on Scripture, not a forceful uh, theological 
ideology that Jesus himself didn't use. Our vision focus for the year is to be a church that is equipped and empowered by the Word of God. A church where the Bible is taught in ways that change people's lives and is practical to everyday life. A church where the gospel is proclaimed and lives are transformed. And throughout this series, we're going to be spending two weeks on understanding what is the gospel. Then we're going to be looking for one week at how to live out the gospel in our everyday life. And finally, we will see how do we share the gospel based on, a, based on scripture. The word that we read as gospel comes from this Greek word, euangelion. It's a compound word, eu meaning good, and angelion meaning announcement, or sometimes we might uh, translate that as news. So good announcement or good news. Uh, Although we know this word euangelion as primarily a religious term, uh, during Jesus' day, it was rarely used as a religious term and rather was used uh, almost explicitly as a political term. During the Roman occupation of Israel, it was common for people to come and share uh, of amazing victories that Caesar was able to make over neighboring nations. People would get up into the middle of the streets, they would call people to come and listen, often Roman guards would force people to come and listen, and then this person would open a scroll and they would read the good news of Caesar and the amazing exploits of his victories over other neighbouring nations. These people who would share this news, they were called witnesses, which gives greater clarity uh, to when Jesus' uh, followers uh, were now called witnesses of the gospel. This was the original way that this word euangelion or gospel had been used within the society of Jesus' day, but Jesus and his disciples decided to take this word, they took this picture to teach a new good news story uh, that is centered around Jesus himself. Now today, we associate this word gospel with Christianity and Christian faith primarily, but in one sense, every person has found their life on some form of gospel and is following some form of, uh, has places their faith in some good news. We all have a good news story that we cling to because we believe that it will improve our own lives and the lives of the people around us. There's the gospel of politics, there's the gospel of climate change, the gospel of LGBTQ plus rights, the gospel of freedom of information, the gospel of global cooperation. There are gospel, um, there are good news stories that people are clinging on to all around us. Every single one of us will cling to a good news story. We will choose to follow one of these because we believe that it will make our lives better and the lives of those around us better. Let's take an example uh, from fairly recently. On 8th of November, 2016, Donald Trump, I just got your attention with that name, I imagine. Uh, On 8th of November, uh, 2016, Donald Trump was elected as president. Uh, Very, very few people were actually expecting this to happen. There were talk show hosts who swore that he would not be elected, and then the night that he was elected, they were in shock and awe at what had happened. When Donald Trump first came onto the scene, very few people believed that he had any real credibility of actually becoming the president, and yet bit by bit it was clear that he was becoming more of a contender. Part of the reason that Trump rose so much uh, in a... um, Uh, in popularity and became president is because he had a simple good news message that he communicated with some level of passion and spoke to these people who would become his followers. And his simple good news message was this, that he would make America great again. That was his good news story that he communicated out to the world. There were people who felt like, uh, who were in the States, who felt like America had lost its way and America was now a bad news story in need of a good news story. So for someone to come in and say, I will make America great again, spoke to many people's lives who wanted that to be their good news story. Irrelevant of whether you like Trump or not, that was a very clever 
good news story to call people to come and follow. This news that he called people to follow uh, led to him becoming the President of the United States. <coughs> now, whether someone is a Christian or not, we all have a we all have some form of good news story that we will follow and centre our lives upon. For us as followers of Jesus, it's important that our lives are centred upon the good news of Jesus, not some other good news story that might be happening uh, around the world. I have seen so many Christians, even recently, particularly recently, centre their lives around a gospel that is primarily centred around a worldly gospel, a worldly good news, not the gospel of Jesus. There is one gospel that we as Christians cling to and centre our lives around, which is the gospel of Jesus. <coughs> but that leaves us with uh, the, probably the most important and clear question, which is, what is the gospel? And then secondly, uh, which is just an important, as important a question, is what is not the gospel. N.T. Wright, a very famous theologian, says this, I am perfectly comfortable with what people normally mean when they say the gospel. I just don't think it is what Paul means. In other words, I am not denying the usual meanings that, uh, that, things are pe that people ought to say, preach about to believe. I simply wouldn't use the word gospel to denote those things. So N.T. Wright's point is that when people often share the gospel, they are sharing good things, they can be sharing truths about Jesus, but often they are not sharing what, uh, what Paul's idea or Jesus' idea or any of the disciples' idea of when the gospel is presented throughout the New Testament. Prior to looking to what the gospel is, I want to take some time to minimise some gospels that might be presented within the church that are different from the gospel presented by Jesus or some of the rest of his disciples. Many Western versions of the gospel can be adjusted to our own experience and church backgrounds, and yet they may not uh, line up with a biblical understanding of what the gospel message really is. A teacher called John Mark Comer, he outlined four examples of, uh, of Gospels that we might follow or preach in the church that aren't the actual Gospel, and we're going to look at uh, some of these this morning. Now, some of these um, might... Uh, now, the way that these are presented may offend or grate uh, some of you, depending on your previous church background, but a couple of things before we get into uh, these different uh, examples. Firstly, uh, ensure that your understanding of the gospel is drawn from Scripture, not primarily from your uh, past church background or experience. Secondly, these are stereotypes that have been presented uh, of these different groups. Not all of these summaries encapsulate everything from these different perspectives. And thirdly, if you have a, an issue with anything I say over the next few minutes, remember that I, I, uh, that I got this from John Mark Comer, and so blame him instead of me. <laughs> Number one of, uh, of um, uh, lacking gospel presentations, the evangelical gospel. So what is it when we talk about the evangelical gospel? You are a sinner going to hell. God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And if you believe in him, you will go to heaven when you die. This is a gospel that many of us in the Western church may have grown up with or may have some understanding of. Generally speaking, a church like ours would be classed as an evangelical church. The evangelical church is generally acknowledged as having four main qualities. Firstly, biblicism, a particular regard for the Bible, meaning uh, all essential spiritual truth is to be found in its pages. The second... Uh, um, the second quality of an evangelical church is, uh, is centred around the cross, so a focus on the atoning work of Christ on the cross. The third uh, quality of an evangelical church is activism, so the belief that the gospel needs to be expressed in effort. And the fourth quality of an evangelical church is conversionism, so the belief that human beings need to be converted. 
So this is the gospel presentation uh, that comes out of a strong desire that people need to be converted, which is what led to the gospel being presented in this way. Now, there's a lot of good about this sort of gospel presentation. One of the best things about this sort of gospel presentation is that it has a strong desire for people to be rescued out of death and into life. Evangelicalism has been one of the key groups in the church today, which has seen more people actively go out and share Jesus with, people than, uh, with more people than possibly any other group. On the other hand, the real negative about a gospel presentation like this isn't necessarily about what it says, it's about what it doesn't say. You don't see this form of gospel presentation anywhere in the New Testament. Simply starting with the fact that we are sinners seems to forget the fact that we were also created in the image of God. Focusing solely on the death of Jesus causes us to neglect the crowning moment of everything, which was his resurrection. Then the idea that we go to heaven when we die forgets the fact that the gospel message is not just about getting us into heaven, or should I say the new heavens and the new earth, but the gospel is far more about bringing heaven down to us. The issue with this gospel narrative is that it seeks to provide the minimum entry requirement to get into heaven when you die. My wife and I have been married for seven years, 11 months, and one week to this day. Hope I get brownie points for that, darling. That's impressive. When I got engaged to my wife, we began the long, tedious process of planning our wedding day. Planning a wedding day was this logistical venture uh, where all we spoke about for the whole time was uh, when we were engaged with the plans around getting married. Now, during that time, imagine if I had gone to my wife and said, I want to do the bare minimum possible for this wedding. I just want to say our vows, exchange rings, go home and be married. That in itself would have been unheard of for my wife, but imagine if I had taken it one step further. Imagine if I had written my vows that, and I simply committed in my vows to doing the absolute bare minimum for our future marriage. Entering into marriage, only seeking to achieve the bare minimum requirements is, in a way, contrary to what the entire point of marriage is all about. So it's important for us, when we present the gospel, to not shortchange God and just provide the bare minimum entry requirements for people, or else this is exactly how God might feel towards us. John Ortberg, a very famous author, he shares this. In this way of thinking about salvation, the goal is to get from down here to up there, about how to know for sure that you're heading to the good place. It usually involves praying a very specific prayer, believing a set of doctrines about God, and other things that make someone a Christian. Ironically, it does not necessarily involve a life of apprenticeship, apprenticeship to Jesus. So that's the first uh, example of how we might uh, display the, uh, share the gospel in our, uh, in our world today. Number two is the Reformed gospel, fairly, uh, tied fairly closely to the evangelical gospel. Um, and the way that this can often be presented is that God is a holy, just God of both love and wrath. You are morally guilty before Him. God's demands must be kept and you cannot possibly do it, but Jesus did it for you on the cross. Now, similarly to the evangelical gospel, there is good and bad within this gospel presentation. The real good is that this seeks to draw from Scripture certain truths about the nature of how to be right uh, of how to be right with God. It also presents truth that there is actually good and evil and that at times these are black and white and these are absolutes, an idea that is increasingly strange in our subjective culture. 
It seeks to draw truths and systematically put them together to present a holistic gospel presentation. So that's the good about a gospel presentation like this. Now, although there is good, like the evangelical gospel, there, it is simply left incomplete. You don't see this gospel presentation in this way included throughout the New Testament. And although drawn from Scripture, it tends to draw individual sections uh, from individual sections to form a system of theology to complement a certain worldview. There is an offshoot from this that has, uh, that's come from this, which has been taught, and can essentially say that you are, so, uh, you are so evil and God is so mad at you that he had to kill his son, Jesus. And this can lead to a great deal of trauma for people when they hear this as the primary message of what Jesus was about. <coughs> this gospel presentation, saying the gospel simply like that, can fly in the face of John, verses like John 3.16, where we see that God didn't uh, hate the world, rather he loved the world so much, which is why he gave his son. So there's two of them, the evangelical gospel, the reformed gospel, gospel and thirdly, the prosperity gospel, the one that every pastor wishes was true then I would have a nicer car and a nicer house. If you want to bless me with either, then God bless you in, uh, in what you do. What is the prosperity gospel? A uh, good summary of it might look something like this, that God loves you and is for you. You are his child. Through his death and resurrection, he won the victory. His victory is your inheritance by faith, victory over sickness, over poverty, over failure, and the best is yet to come. There is both a version of this that is a hard prosperity gospel and then a softer prosperity gospel. A hard prosperity gospel that been, has been uh, widely discredited through televangelists who have had many public disgraces, some sexual disgraces, some uh, financial, and have also promoted teaching that has been clearly against the teaching of Jesus in a bid to get millions of dollars from suffering nations around the world. But then there is a softer prosperity gospel that is far more prevalent within the world today and would be taught by some really great people in some great churches. Um, like the other two gospel presenta uh, uh, presentations, there are people who are obviously evangelical and reformed and prosperity teachers who are really good teachers uh, throughout the world. Now, the softer prosperity gospel is harder to define from the harder prosperity gospel because it often fades in and out uh, of, uh, of certain teaching from some pastors. Now, the good, uh, the good about a gospel presentation like this is that, um, is that it shows that God really does love you, even through the most difficult of circumstances. Another good thing about this, there is a knowledge that God is able to work in supernatural power and accomplish miracles, even to this day. Often, prosperity um, preaching churches have been quick to give money to social needs uh, within communities and have been at the forefront of, multi, of the multi-ethnic church. So there's a lot of great things that come from um, churches that have preached the prosperity gospel. But the bad about a, pro, uh, about a presentation like this is that this gospel presentation goes against uh, lived experience, uh, the lived experience of Jesus, the disciples, and virtually everyone within the early church. Jesus himself was a man of simplicity, not extravagance. And to be a Christian in the early church meant that you would likely have all of your possessions taken away from you, causing poverty. And you would uh, experience cruelty from the Roman officials, often causing a lack of help. The, uh, this phrase that can often be around that's uh, said at the end, the best is yet to come, is technically true if we are thinking about the new heavens and the new earth, but it has the potential of causing large amounts of disillusionment for many, many people, particularly those who are experiencing some form of illness in their life. It can cause huge amounts of damage to people who hear this forced upon them. I have a friend of mine who was born with uh, type 1 diabetes, and this friend of mine uh, has needed insulin 
from a very young age simply to stay alive. And unfortunately, at the stage of his birth, a harder prosperity gospel was far more common. And his parents had been told by some of their friends, if you only had more faith, then your child would not have diabetes. This wrecked my friend's parents and led to them feeling somewhat ostracized by their local church. Another relative of mine went to a church that preached a very hard prosperity gospel, and unfortunately this relative uh, developed uh, cancer in their old age. This relative gave away all of their possessions to the church, the pastor in particular, because they were told that if they did that, then they would be healed of their cancer. This relative gave away everything that they had to the church, ultimately dying poor and once again somewhat caught, some, somewhat cut off from their community, believing that they had not done enough and being told explicitly that they had not done enough. Now, although there is good that can come from following elements of this way of thinking, my experience has been that it can do even more damage when good, when pursued down a very hard line. Now, the final uh, gospel, which can be popularized, is the social gospel. What is it? Uh, this one has it's a bit longer. It's become a bit more prominent uh, over the past few years. Uh, Jesus was a political re revolutionary who came to liberate the poor and the marginalized from the hierarchy of oppression. He was killed as a threat to the status quo of empire and he inaugurated a kingdom of peace and justice and equality. Jesus was on the march now like he was then to stand up against those who abuse power and deliberate um, those on the margin, such as the poor, the immigrant, the, uh, the refugee, the BIPOC community, the LGBTQ plus community, and many more. And the church's role is essentially an activist role to move Western society towards a, a progressive and socialist political model. Now, the good about a, uh, a gospel presentation like this, there is language of the kingdom used in this gospel narrative, a word that Jesus himself which we'll look at a bit later, regularly uses to sum up his purposes here on earth. This gospel presentation demonstrates that heaven is less about uh, us going to heaven, but rather heaven coming to dwell with us, somewhat in the, uh, in the here and now, and then ultimately in the future. This gospel presentation shows that preaching the gospel is inevitably linked with our behavior and how we live out the gospel in our everyday lives. This gospel presentation is very much in line with Jesus' uh, teaching around the Sermon on the Mount, seeking to help and bless the most vulnerable within society. So there's a lot of good, once again, about this gospel presentation, but there are problems with this as well. One of the biggest problems with this is that Jesus did not come as a political leader. Jesus did not come to abolish the Roman powers and build a kingdom to fight against the oppression of the Romans. Rather, he built a kingdom within people's hearts and minds. The other big problem here is that there are multiple issues of sin that Jesus actively combated with within people's lives, irrelevant of whether they were marginalized or not. Jesus did not preach anything goes and we just need to love one another. He preached a higher level of morality than e what, uh, what even many of us are comfortable with at times in the church. And so that right there is a few well-known pre uh, presentations of the gospel that we might say in our lives or that we may have heard that are somewhat true and somewhat helpful, but lacking of what the true gospel message really is. And over today and next Sunday, we're going to look at several gospel presentations shown throughout Scripture to try and gain some level of clarity around this question, what is the gospel? Next week, there will be a booklet uh, provided online and on the welcome desk that will tie a lot of these gospel presentations uh, that we'll be looking at together. But today, I just want to look at one gospel presentation in the Bible, and that is the gospel according to Jesus. John Mark Comer, once again, he says this, if we don't start with the gospel Jesus preached, we could easily end up with a gospel Jesus did not preach. 
So today we start with Jesus' presentation of the gospel. But what was the good news that Jesus preached? We see this in just a couple of short verses in Mark 1, 14 to 15. And it's these verses. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That right there, that is the gospel that Jesus came and preached very, very, um, in a very summarized way. Jesus, he references the, gos- uh, the kingdom, sorry, 126 times throughout the four gospel accounts. The message of the kingdom was central to the teaching of Jesus, so much so that he declared that this was the good news that he came to bring. <clears throat> now, most of us are fairly unfamiliar with this language of kingdom. We don't really use terminology like that unless we're thinking about something like the show The Crown. The Crown, it depicts the... Uh, who here has watched The Crown? Just wondering, who here is familiar with it? Many of you. Uh, the Crown, it depicts the life of Queen Elizabeth II and tries to dramatise some of the most significant lo- uh, moments in her life as the Queen. It's a uh, well-done uh, depiction. I'm not sure how accurate it really is. I enjoy watching it on occasion. Uh, but essentially, it portrays the life of Queen Elizabeth like any other Hollywood drama. Uh, we've seen lots of the royal family on our TV screens over the past several years. Uh, many of you would remember the, uh, the death of Princess Diana. More recently, we've had the drama of Harry and Meghan, which has been every journalist's dream. Uh, we had the death of the Duke of Edinburgh and the death of the Queen, and most recently, the inauguration of King Charles. Now, I'm not particularly opinionated one way or the other as to whether we become a republic or remain part of the Commonwealth. I'm happy with whichever gives us more public holidays. Um, But irrelevant of your uh, perspective on this issue, the royal family has been steeped in drama as long as I've been alive and a long time before that. For many of us, this is the closest understanding that we might have to... Uh, to the message of a kingdom. The royal family have no particular say on how I live my day-to-day life. They have very little political influence, particularly on Australia. And so our understanding of kingdom is vastly different than what was understood in Jesus' day. As many of you would be aware, Jesus, uh, during Jesus' time, the Roman Empire was the ruling empire of the day. Um, Due to the Israelites' rebellion against God, the Old Testament is filled with occasions that God allowed the Israelite nation to come under the rule, uh, to, to allow them to come under the rule of certain kingdoms. And the latest in line was the kingdom of Rome. The Israelites were used to, uh, they were used to the idea of kingdoms and what a kingdom should look like, um, which is partly why they believe the Messiah would establish an earthly kingdom. The, uh, the kingdom of Rome, they ruled the Israelite people harshly, so the general population would li- have lived on the edge of poverty, living week to week or even day to day. Uh, often Israelite people could be taxed up to 80% of their earnings. Uh, a lot of this was taken by the uh, Jewish collect- uh, tax collectors of the day. They were required to submit to whatever the Roman authorities told them to do. They would kill Israelite people on a whim, even going so far as to publicly crucify anyone who rebelled against them. And so the Israelite people have a, gr- have a clear idea of kingdom in their mind. Their idea of kingdom is all about power and dominance and control and victory. And then Jesus comes onto the scene and proclaims that he has come to bring God's kingdom into being. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. This is a real moment to have heard uh, Jesus say. This is an incredible moment. It is at this point that he declares a new kingdom has arrived and is now here to stay. Now, we look on this with the benefit of hindsight, but Jesus' followers would have heard this and thought, that's great, 
So when is this new kingdom arriving? Everything feels the same right now. The Romans are still in charge. It doesn't feel like anything has changed. How has this time come now? Now, the kingdom of God was so different than anything that the listeners of Jesus would have been ready for. As I said before, they thought it was all about power, dominance, control, and victory, but the kingdom of God looked completely different. Their idea of kingdom was of all about power, but Jesus came to demonstrate true, pa- true power, a power to save people from their sins and raise people to new life. Their idea of the kingdom was all about dominance, but Jesus came to tell his followers to give up their rights and to take up their cross. Their idea of kingdom is all about control, but Jesus calls his disciples to relinquish control of their own lives and submit to him as king. Their idea of kingdom is all about victory, but Jesus came to bring the ultimate victory, a victory that is greater over sin and over death. And the way that Jesus tells people to understand this new kingdom is through this word, repent. Now, we understand uh, the word repent often as stop sinning, live different. But repent, it literally means to change your mind, to change the way that you are currently thinking. In the words of Romans, be renewed by the transforming of your mind. Allow something in your mind to change. So as soon as Jesus tells his listeners that the time has come, he also tells them to change their mind about what they have thought the kingdom of God was going to look like. (coughs) He is telling his listeners, forget everything you thought you knew about the kingdom. Change your mind because the kingdom of God is good news for everyone to hear. There are three ways that Jesus changed and continues to change views on the kingdom of God. Firstly, the kingdom of God is here, but also coming. Jesus would sometimes talk about this kingdom of God having come already, but it is also coming uh, into fulfillment into the future. Secondly, the kingdom of Jesus is unlike anything, uh, any of the kingdoms of this world. As we've already discussed, this kingdom was unlike any of the previous kingdoms that the world had to offer. And thirdly, the kingdom of God expands and grows not through coercive force, but through suffering love. Most kingdoms and worldviews throughout history have been brought about through force or aggressive rhetoric. But the res- revolutions of the, uh, of the past century have been brought, through, um, brought about almost exclusively in this way. But the revolution that the kingdom of God uh, uh, came to bring, um, was, uh, was, uh, it was brought about simply through loving other people. A love that is willing to lay down your life for your enemies. A love that finds its... Uh, that it's better to give than to receive, a love that is unconditional in nature and sacrificial in practice. Through Jesus telling his listeners to repent, to change their mind about what they understood the kingdom to be, he is telling them to uh, adjust their understanding of, uh, of what the kingdom truly is to align with Jesus' understanding of the kingdom. And so what is the kingdom of God? What is this good news that Jesus was preaching. The kingdom is established right at the very beginning of the Bible. Humanity is designed to reign, rule, have dominion over creation. This is kingdom language that's used here at the, uh, at the point of creation. We are placed here to co-rule with God over the earth. But we as co-rulers with God, we rebel against God. We essentially create our own rebellion against God's kingdom. We try to seize dominion over this kingdom for ourselves in attempting to attain the knowledge of good and evil so that we could rule how we saw fit. And due to this, these people, co-rulers, they're exiled from the garden and are shut out from the reign of God, no longer having the status of co-rulers next to the one true king. Humanity is left to their own kingdom and their own reign, which does not end well. Again and again, humanity fails in being able to reign itself with any sense of justice and love. But God, 
being a God of both justice and love, makes a promise with humanity, declaring that there can be a nation that can co-rule with God once again. Constantly, this nation rebels against the king again and again and again, falling into the same trap that Adam and Eve fell into in the Garden of Eden. Eventually, it becomes clear that humanity, as it stands, is unable to work alongside God as king due to their constant rebellion. The once co-rulers with God, they need to be saved from themselves and from the consequence of their actions. And at the, old, at the end of the Old Testament, Israel is waiting for the kingdom of God to come. A kingdom that has been prophesied throughout the Old Testament writings with a Messiah leading the way into this new kingdom. And then Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, arrives to usher in this new kingdom, not like any kingdom of this earth. And then through repenting or changing your mind and ultimately placing our trust in Jesus, then we are able to enter into this new kingdom. It's believing through repenting in Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, that we are now able to enter into the kingdom that Jesus announced here to his listeners. And when we do this, we are restored to our rightful place, the place that we should have had right at the beginning, as co-rulers with God, entering into an eternity where the new kingdom will be revealed through Jesus' return. And that is the gospel that Jesus preached, the gospel of the kingdom with himself reigning as king above and over all. There are many areas of the kingdom of God which our society is seeking to achieve. Ultimately, our entire political system is designed around trying to create a kingdom that we individually believe will be most beneficial to society. We will lean uh, one way or the other, depending on our idea of what our kingdom should look like. But ultimately, we are left, all of us, with one significant problem, that our world desires a kingdom without a king. <coughs> within every single one of us, we know that we were created within the image of God in order to co-rule with him. Whether we acknowledge this or not, we know that we were created this way because we are constantly trying to build our own kingdoms to make the world around us operate according to how we believe it should operate. Experts say that we are far less in control of ourselves and our kingdoms than we think that we are. We are in control of a very small percentage of our small little kingdoms. And we are even less control, uh, less in control of our wider national or even international kingdoms. We all have tried to live our lives without a king operating over us, and this is what sin is. Our world seeks to experience the kingdom that they, might, uh, that they believe is right in their own eyes without having any reign of a king over them. But the only way that we can truly experience the nature of the kingdom that we are created for is through following the only one true king. There is a king who has brought his kingdom and who will bring his kingdom. There is a king who we were designed to co-rule alongside of. But it's our rebellion that has cast us away from this position but through a radical transformation, transformation that can come through trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we can now be restored to our rightful place alongside God. This is the way that Jesus spoke of and demonstrated the good news through the message of the kingdom. Now, this isn't the only way that the good news was spoken of. Other ways throughout the New Testament will be discussed next week but it is the way that Jesus begun the good news being spread, and it was the way that Jesus himself described his purposes here on earth, to, to establish an, eterning, an eternal reigning kingdom um, for all. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Preach the good news, this good news of the kingdom. 
Jesus starts his ministry by proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. And at the end, he calls his followers to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Who has God maybe called you to proclaim the good news to? Who are those people in your own life who he has placed on your heart, who you know aren't living under his kingship, and he has given you this message of the good news to be able to share with them. In future weeks, we're going to explore how we do this. Next week, we'll be providing, as I mentioned earlier, a booklet on different expressions of the gospel and how we can share it with different people. Um, But as we've spoken through this gospel um, that Jesus presented, what should be on your heart as I'm speaking about this is not just some theoretical exercise as we go through this, and not just some intellectual exercise, but what should be on our heart is that person or people in your life who need to hear this message and have their lives transformed by entering into the kingdom of God. And how would you share that message with them. Throughout this week, I just want to offer you one bit of, um, I guess, homework, you might call it that. Um, I just want to uh, give you a a challenge, an opportunity. Um, If there is someone in your life who you have been praying for for a long time, and you know that God has placed them on your heart to share the good news of Jesus with them, how would you share the good news of the kingdom with this person? How would you be able to communicate effectively the news that Jesus came, (laughs) that he lived perfectly, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, and he calls people to then place their trust in him, being able to then return to their rightful place as co-rulers? How would you be able to share that message with this person that God has uh, brought into your life so that you might be able to, uh, to see them enter into the kingdom. Ultimately, that is something that God has called every single one of us to do. This is not a good news message that we cling to ourselves and rejoice in the fact that now we have entered into the kingdom and we have uh, now this, this, renewed, um, this renewed relationship with God. But this is something that we seek every single person that we come into contact with to know as well. Let me pray. Jesus, we, um, we thank you for your, uh, the clarity of the message that you came to, to bring. We thank you for this message when you said, the time has come, the kingdom is here, <laughs> repent and believe the good news. And right now, God, for any of us who have been maybe placing our trust in wrong kingdoms or worldly kingdoms, Would you turn our trust back to you? For any of us in uh, in this room, God, who have maybe tried to live a life and build a kingdom without a king, Lord, would you help us to look to you as the one true king, the one who is able to um, to do more and accomplish more in our lives and other people's lives than we would ever be able to ourselves. And Lord, as we think about these people that you have placed in our lives who need to hear the good news, Lord, I do ask that you will help us to to be able to share this effectively with them. You have made us witnesses of the good news, sharers of the good news. And what good news it is, God, What wonderful news it is that you, a king, would choose to be with us, would choose to call us your children. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that that involves. We thank you that also means that we are your adopted heirs, heirs of the king. What an amazing king you are. And so we just want to worship you right now, our great king, our wonderful king, our beautiful king, Jesus' name.
praise you because you are so good. We thank you for your gospel coming from your son, Jesus, as he declares it in his word. We praise you, Lord. We bless you this morning, Father. We thank you for the good things you have done in our lives and how you continue to be good for us. We pray that as we go this morning that we can take your gospel with us and not the gospel that we want to put in our own hearts, but the gospel that comes from you. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Please hang around, have a coffee with us, and uh, God bless. Thank you.